Hello, and welcome to MC Squared. On this podcast, you can enjoy deep discussions and interviews about everything science with the best minds in the field. I'm Sanjum Sangari, and this episode's topic will be the recent discovery of a new technique for mapping genetic networks using an improvement to CRISPR-Cas9. This new technique, named CyberSeq, can tweak several thousand genes at once to determine their impacts instead of only one at a time, as CRISPR-Cas9 can. With me today, I have Dr. Ryan Muller, a graduate student from UC Berkeley who has studied genome sequencing and gene expressions. Dr. Muller and his group of researchers were able to increase CRISPR's efficiency in terms of genome sequencing and gene expression, and its prospects for the future as well. Welcome, Dr. Muller. It is an honor to have you on the podcast. Sure. Thanks for having me. So before we begin, I think it is important for the audience to get to know the basics of CRISPR-Cas9 as your discovery revolves mostly around its functionality. So could you explain how CRISPR-Cas9 operated previously uh, before your research was conducted? Yeah, sure. So um, there's a lot of uh, excitement about CRISPR-Cas9. It's a RNA-guided DNA endonuclease, uh, which means that the enzyme uses a short guide RNA sequence uh, to cut a very specific sequence of DNA. And the reason this is so powerful is that you can Uh, cut a very specific site in the genome, for example, uh, for health implications, basic research implications. Uh, So there's a lot of um, useful applications uh, for a very simple sounding tool as Cas9. Right. And so um, now that we understand CRISPR-Cas9 a little better after your explanation, what exactly is its functionality in relation to your research and your discovery that you've done? Sure. So uh, for uh, our work, CyberSeq, uh, we use CRISPR-Cas9. I guess I I like to think of it as uh, two different modules to CyberSeq. So there is a way that we need to perturb the system, which is um, CRISPR-Cas9-based technology. And then there's a way that we need to read out the signal. And and really in our research, um, the key innovation was figuring out a really good way to read out a good signal um, in a lot of different um, perturbations across like um, a pool of perturbations caused by CRISPR-Cas9. Right. So would you say that um, with your discovery, it's sort of like an addition to CRISPR-Cas9 in a sense that it sort of um, adds more to it or it expedites um, its functionality a little bit? How would you say that works? Um, I would say the the main innovation is being able to read out um, a lot of perturbations really quickly. So um, I guess, for example, in um, the way that Cas9 generally or initially was used, uh, people could perturb one specific gene and then they could see what function um, or what the effects are of that one specific perturbation. Uh, But our innovation was being able to uh, perturb a lot of different things at the same time in different cells and then measure the effects all at once. So it really speeds up uh, the research and the way, um, all the different uh, kinds of perturbations you can measure at a specific p- point in time. Right. So what your discovery does is basically it takes uh, what CRISPR can do in with one gene at a time, and you're able to do that with um, multiple genes, almost like hundreds at a time at the at the same time. Oh yeah, even more than hundreds. In our study, we we did six thousand. So. Yeah. Wow, 6,000. Yeah. And so um, as you're able to do these experiments faster and faster and with more at once, does this have any uh, implications on your research except for um, just speed? Does it also impact other things? Yeah. So um, how should I say this? I guess um, what what's very useful... Uh, about CyberSeq, I would say specifically, is um, that you can ask a very specific question. Um, and so previously in the field, um, a lot of these, there, there are there were previously different ways to indirectly measure the effects of a lot of different perturbations at the same time, either with like growth screens or uh, facts-based screens. Um, but these, uh, both of these techniques were um, somewhat indirect. And so... Uh, what was very useful about CyberSeq is that you can get a very specific quantitative understanding of a perturbation 
uh, across a lot of different perturbations uh, instead of an indirect um, sort of thing that previous techniques had, had figured out. Right. So getting into a little bit more detail here, um, what have you changed and improved in your work with uh, CyberSeq that uh, other than speed like hasn't really been possible before uh, with CRISPR-Cas9? And um, I guess another way to say it is like, how much more efficient is CyberSeq than CRISPR in um, the gene work that it does? Um, I guess, sorry, can, can you clarify uh, how do you mean by more efficient? Um, sure. Like I mean, like in experiments that work through CRISPR-Cas9 and gene editing with that, how would people who are running those experiments use CyberSeq in their uh, experiments to like accomplish the same task? But um, either would that work as they would choose CyberSeq over CRISPR-Cas9 uh, for efficiency, or would both of them do different tasks? Oh, okay. I, I think maybe there's a, a little bit of a misunderstanding. So, so CyberSeq uses um, CRISPR-Cas9. So, um, CyberSeq is built on CRISPR-Cas9, but um, CyberSeq allows you to do a lot of CRISPR-Cas9 experiments at once. Um, right. Okay. I see. So. Basically, uh, CyberSeq is used on CRISPR-Cas9 with CRISPR-Cas9 to uh, do the same kind of experiments, except uh, at a much greater speed with much yeah. more efficiency. Sure. Yeah, exactly. So, so maybe if, if you'd like an example, um, say you're interested in um, this, maybe say you're, you're interested in this gene that is expressed um, in cancer cells, for example, um, and you want to know what other genes uh, regulate that one gene. Um, you could use uh, you could use CRISPR-Cas9 individually to one at a time knock out genes you think might be involved and see their effect. Or you can use CyberSeq and you can survey across the whole genome and you can get um, a complete answer of every single gene uh, at the same time. Uh, so it's a lot quicker. It's unbiased. You're able to find um, things you might not have expected going in. Right. And uh, in your research paper uh, that your team published, sure. you refer to being able to barcode specific reporter genes to identify their functions using CyberSeq. So could you explain uh, a little bit what this means and how um, researchers like yourself go about doing this? Sure. So um, by barcoding, I, it's more like a metaphorical sort of um, analogy, but, but really we're... Um, we developed uh, a way to track uh, different genes at the same time. So say, for example, um, we're interested in gene A and what regulates gene A. So we can um, have a barcode on different perturbations uh, and we can see, uh, we can track each of these barcodes and we can see how each of them affects gene A. So say we have a barcode that maps to, we're going to perturb um, this gene important in development. Um, we can measure the barcode by sequencing and see how that affects gene A. And then we can look at this other gene maybe involved in metabolism with a different barcode. We can measure that barcode by sequencing and see how that impacts uh, gene A as well. Uh, right. So you're, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I was finished. Okay. And so your work with uh, barcoding reporter genes and other um, processes like this, would you say that this is sort of a technique to analyze uh, which variables affect certain parts of um, like of the DNA? Yeah, I would. Yeah. In, in essence, your um, yeah, that's, that's the, the part of it that you're um, looking at you're taking like one very specific um, narrow thing that we're perturbing each of these different genes using Cas9 and we're seeing how that affects one specific gene you're, we're very interested in. Um, and we use right. um, barcodes to bridge the um, bridge that sensing. Bridge and have you done this testing with any specific um, genes and reporter genes so far yet? Or are you still in the process of working to develop cyber cyberseq yeah we've um in, in the paper we we um uh measured a lot of different reported genes uh, that we're interested in um 
I think maybe the, the one that was sort of at the core of the, the paper was um, the HIS4 uh, promoter, which is a reporter for um, cell stress. And so we originally, I, I guess it's sort of serendipitous, this, this study or the result we found, because we originally uh, used HIS4 uh, as a, um, because we thought we would, we would know exactly what we'd get out of it. So it'd be like a good validation of CyberSeq. But then we used CyberSeq and we found uh, new additional things that we didn't even expect. Um, and so we found a whole new branch of a regulatory pathway that is able to regulate the HIS4 expression uh, that hadn't been previously um, discovered. And so I think that is part of like why CyberSeq is so um, exciting is that you can find new things that you um, might not think to look for. Right. And do you think that uh, your experience with your experiences with HIS4 um, and how you sort of found something completely different than what you were originally looking for. Do you think this is something that you, um, scientists using CyberSeq can uh, encounter and accomplish with almost any gene that they look at? Yeah, sure. I, I think one of the nice selling points about CyberSeq is that uh, you can um, you can switch in that gene A for any gene you're interested in. So in our study, we looked at six or so um, specific genes, uh, and we were able to map all the regulators of that specific gene. Um, and so uh, other researchers have a lot of different genes they're interested in. They can switch in any gene they're interested in um, and understand the regulators involved. Right. So getting a little bit uh, more towards talking about CyberSeq, uh, how did your research team come up with this revolutionary technique uh, for studying gene expression? So could you describe your team or the steps that uh, you and your research team took in the process of your research that led up to your discoveries with CyberSeq? Sure. Uh, so the team includes uh, myself, um, two other lab members, Zaria and Lucas, as well as uh, Nick Ngolia, who's a RPI. And um, I guess we, we sort of, um, we didn't intentionally set out to build CyberSeq, I would say, in the beginning. Um, uh, originally, when I came to the lab, I was interested in understanding this very specific phenomenon um, called ribosome stalling in cells. And uh, I worked away at understanding um, ribosome stalling for a while, didn't get anywhere. Um, and then um, I guess there, there was sort of this like eureka moment that we could use um, I, I guess I developed, I'd spent a long time trying to develop um, CRISPR screens to understand um, ribosome stalling and, and sort of the eureka moment was that we could use barcodes to bridge the gap um, and to measure the effects of all different genes at once to figure out what genes are involved in ribosome stalling. And then right. um, it turned out that another group already um, found the regulatory mechanisms um, regarding ribosome stalling through more conventional um, labor intensive means, but uh, the technique itself we found very useful. And so we um, set off to, to build the methodology of CyberSeq. Uh, and it seems like people are very excited generally about it. And uh, it is a very uh, useful technique for a lot of different, um, understanding a lot of different aspects of gene regulation. Right. So I'm um, now talking about a little more of the effects of CyberSeq and um, I guess its possibilities in other fields. How can um, scientists and researchers such as yourself use CyberSeq in fields of science other than uh, how it is currently being used uh, right now in your research for report reporter genes and barcoding? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, I guess there are there, there are a lot of different ways that CyberC can be used. Um, so in, in sort of like, if you're thinking like the central dogma of like transcription, translation, um, like post-translational modifications, uh, CyberC can be used. We, we developed a way to use it in every single um, step of that pathway, um, which encompasses a lot of biology. Um, you can put in, um, Things involved in, for example, like metabolic flux. If you have like a good 
reporter for that. Um, you can uh, substitute that in for the um, the gene that you're interested in. Um, there are a lot of um, there are a lot of different ways that you can use CyberSeq um, really to understand a lot of different areas of biology, from um, understanding like cancer progression to um, virology. As long as there's some sort of RNA intermediate, then really you can use CyberSeq to study it. Right. And like, as of now, um, do, as, as of like now, right after um, your, you and your team did your research, CyberSeq is still a very uh, new technique sure. uh, in relation to like genetics and things like that. So what would you recommend the next steps would be when dealing with a CyberSeq, like improving it, using it, um, like for other researchers in the future? Sure. So, so our research was using it in yeast, um, and there are a lot of different questions you can ask in yeast, but um, basically the number one question I always get is, um, can you use CyberSeq in mammalian cells? And so we're currently developing um, a way to port the whole system to mammalian cells to understand um, biological questions in mammalian cells, um, including human cells, which people are particularly excited about. So I, I would say that that's like the most immediate next step. Um, Additionally, there are um, there are a lot of processes that um, use RNA, so transcription, uh, translation. Um, uh, but there are um, there are other processes people are interested in. So we're also um, developing and modifying CyberSeq to be able to um, broaden the kinds of questions you can ask with CyberSeq as well. Right, and before you mentioned that the other research team. Um, that you found was also working on a similar project as you, um, that they were using more labor-intensive um, programs to accomplish their tasks. And do you believe that uh, your use of CyberSeq can replace these labor-intensive programs, like for efficiency and other reasons? Yeah, sure. I um, yeah, I think there are. Um, it'll it'll depend maybe on the very specific aspect of, of the question, but I think that what's nice is that this um, techniques in some ways democratize the science. So you don't have to have a fancy million dollar fax machine. You don't have to have a collaboration with um, a lab that can, um, with the robotics that can like do each one individually. Um, someone with a sort of like standard lab equipment um, can build this setup and um, be able to ask a lot of different questions at once in one experiment with CyberSeq. Um, so it, um, yeah, so I think sometimes it'll depend on the, on the specific question, but um, for that specific uh, question that we're asking, uh, CyberSeq would be a faster and, and easier way to answer that question in theory. Right. And so when we talk about such a revolutionary means of gene sequencing uh, and genetics like CyberSeq, uh, it's also important to talk about its potential in, for example, medical fields as well. So what promise does CyberSeq uh, show uh, currently in regards to curing or halting any genetic medical diseases that are pervasive right now? Uh, sure. So um, I would say at, at this current stage, CyberSeq is, is more of like a basic research tool. So. It's really good at um, answering the question, what genes regulate my gene of interest? Um, there are, so, so I would say like, there isn't a direct way that it's um, uh, immediately um, solving some sort of like um, finding a cure or solving a, a, a disease, but it is um, a good foundation to figure out where to start. So if you have, um, uh, for example, we, uh, actually um, started a collaboration uh, where we're looking at um, coronavirus infection. We know that it's an RNA virus and um, we're interested in what factors might regulate specific processes, um, RNA-centric uh, processes um, in the replication cycle of coronavirus. So um, CyberSeq could provide a really good way of identifying key genes that can regulate this process and um, in a more indirect way, um, find good targets for, for drug therapies. Um, yeah, so there are, there are certainly a lot of ways to use CyberSeq um, to find 
useful targets for um, disease treatment, but I think um, directly maybe not um, currently set up for that. Right. So CyberSeq is more um, a tool in the long path to discovering um, an antidote or a cure to uh, a, disease, a disease. It mostly focuses on expediting the, uh, the process. Right. Yeah, exactly. Okay. I see. Uh, thank you. So um, now we have covered uh, medical fields, but there are many other parts of genetic studies uh, that CyberSeq could also uh, be potentially um, extremely helpful in, I'm sure. So what are some, any other implications of your discovery uh, in terms of genetic research um, just going forward? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I, I guess <laughs> it's hard for me to to maybe name directly a, a field that um, that I guess stands out amongst the others. I, I think um, the way science usually works is that uh, we release a tool like this and, and uh, through the collective hive mind, they um, researchers find very useful novel ways to use um, techniques for their own specific research. Um, but really, I, I think you could name, I mean, RNA is centric to basically any biological process. You can name nearly any field uh, in biology, and I'm sure CyberC could lend some insight into that, immunology, cancer development, um, stem cell biology. Yeah, there are, there are a lot of different um, aspects that uh, CyberC could certainly be useful for. Right. And have you had any research in um, any of these scientific, have you had any researchers in like these scientific fields um, that have come to like you or your team and um, asked to like work with CyberSeq a little more in depth in like their own fields or anything like that? Sure. Yeah. The, the paper is still quite recent, but we have had some people reach out who are interested in using it. Um, there are, I would say the the questions are um, very specific um, and maybe don't necessarily, um, I, I would say uh, maybe for like a general audience, maybe don't <laughs> really mean much to, to a general audience, but um, certainly there are people interested in, um, I guess we have one collaboration um, where a group is very interested in this specific RNA species that has a very weird behavior. And they want to use CyberSeq to understand what um, causes this very weird behavior of this RNA um, throughout the life cycle of yeast. Um, yeah, so um, I guess only time will tell, but um, certainly there are definitely people um, reaching out, asking for um, collaborations or, or advice on how to set up their own um, CyberSeq screens in their labs. Right. And um, sort of adding on to this a little bit, do you, uh, what are the next steps, or what do you believe are the next steps that will occur um, now in the fields of research and genetics um, that have either reached out to you or that you um, plan on talking with about CyberSeq? What do you believe that the next steps for these um, researchers and these fields uh, with CyberSeq um, that they can use the knowledge that you currently have right now in their own fields? Like, what do you believe are the next steps for people like those who have emailed you so far? Oh, okay. The next the next step for them. Um, or like any person who is trying to use your um, your techniques. Um, yeah, I I mean, yeah, I think it's it's still like very early stages in terms of what what they're um, using CyberSeq for. So I think um, I would say CyberSeq really um, and in general. Um, genetic screens in general are useful uh, as a s starting point for research. So you have you have like a question that you don't know a lot about. You use some sort of genetic screen, including uh, CyberSeq, to get like a really good idea of where to start. And then once you know where to start, um, you can do more follow-up experiments, um, characterization of a very in a very specific narrow window of genes that you know um, are somehow involved in this process to really understand mechanisms that are on, that are going on. And so that's, um, I would say generally, that's that's probably the framework that most collaborators using CyberSeq will use um, as a CyberSeq more as like a, a starting point, uh, a very useful one uh, to narrow down and, uh, and not like chase um, things that uh, aren't really related to your process. But um, yeah, I would say that's 
the main utility um, for collaborating right. using CyberSeq. Right. And you mentioned before that um, CyberSeq is still in a very early stage um, of its use and um, the capabilities of what all it can do. So do you think that um, other researcher teams, um, such as your own, that are working with CyberSeq, are going to try to sort of uh, improve it or add more uh, to the technology? And if so, um, would you and your team be um, present there or like be trying to work with those teams to better the product? Um, yeah, so I, I, I suppose there, there's, um, in, in our own lab, we are currently developing um, improvements to CyberSeq. Um, I don't know offhand if any collaborators or people who've seen the paper are developing uh, CyberSeq in any other um, ways, but if they reach out, then certainly um, that could be something that we're involved in. Um, it would depend on collaborators if they reached out or if they feel like they have a way to retool CyberSeq in an interesting way that's useful for them. They may end up just uh, doing it on their own. So, um, yeah, hard to say, but um, certainly any any tool can be incrementally improved upon. And so, um, I'm excited to see what um, things people come up with <laughs> and how they root, how they um, modify the tool for their own use. Right. And so, moving into a little bit of a big picture situation, I guess. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that CyberSeq? will have uh, almost as much or as much as an effect on genetic research and uh, beyond uh, all of the things that we've covered uh, as CRISPR-Cas9 has in the past? Or do you think um, it would be more of sort of a tool to add to CRISPR-Cas9? Uh, oh, I, I, I'm not going to, um, I guess, compete with, with CRISPR-Cas9. I mean, CyberSeq does use CRISPR-Cas9. so. Um... I would say that this is an incremental tool that is uh, useful for um, magnifying the utility of CRISPR-Cas9, but itself isn't um, is, is uh, highly dependent upon CRISPR-Cas9 technology, and so um, it's a useful modification to the tool, but not itself a standalone tool, uh, independent. Right, and CRISPR-Cas9 has been around for uh, a while now. Um, talking in terms of 2020, and are were there any other modifications to CRISPR-Cas9, um, like besides yours that performed similar tasks, or are you is what you and your research team have done with CyberSeq, um, sort of like uh, as you would say a whole new world when it talk when considering um, a, like gene sequencing and the work that you could do with CRISPR before. Um, I would say there there are a lot of um techniques built upon Cas9 that were very similar to, similar to ours. Um, there are, let's see, um, there was, so thinking back on, on I guess, like the history of, of CRISPR-Cas9. So CRISPR-Cas9 was um, discovered um, and used for gene editing. Um, and very soon after that, um, people developed uh, different modifications to change the way that CRISPR-Cas9 can perturb uh, gene sequences, um, including transcriptional, uh, which is the version that uh, our research uses. Uh, and then very soon after that, people developed uh, useful ways to do high throughput screens. Um, these were built um, almost entirely on growth screens or fax screens. Um, different ways to perturb and then select for a subset of um, cells that had a interesting phenotype. Um, and our technique uses a lot of, borrows a lot of um, techniques in the history of um, the development of CRISPR-Cas9 and puts them all together into one tool. Um, so it takes the... Um, the ability to perturb genes from um, CRISPR-Cas9, the um, ability to perform high throughput screens from s some of these growth screens, uh, and barcode, um, nucleotide barcoding that um, a couple um, projects have used here and there. And it um, 
puts them all together in, into a, a very nice tool that is able to um, understand very quantitatively a lot of different perturbations at the same time. Right. And were there any other of these, um, I guess, modifications to CRISPR-Cas9 that you and your team looked at and used as sort of, I wouldn't say a blueprint, but used as sort of an inspiration for your work with uh, CyberSeq? Um, let's see. I mean, I, I would say that um, CyberSeq can be, I guess I, I would consider Cas9 as, as like one module of CyberSeq. And the nice thing about having uh, a modular design is that you can swap it out with um, different uh, modules. And so, um, and so uh, maybe this is sort of related to one of the previous questions you asked, how, you, how we can uh, retool um, CyberSeq, you can actually replace that module with something else. So for example, there's cutting CRISPR, um, there is transcription repressor CRISPR, which is the one that we used in, in our um, study, but then there's also transcription activation CRISPR, uh, which we didn't use and which uh, I imagine other researchers would probably be very interested in using. You can um, switch that in with uh, the same sort of CyberSeq framework. Um, and so there are, um, in, in serving all the different kinds of modifications people in the past have used um, and perturbed CyberSeq, or sorry, all the different um, modifications people have made to Cas9, um, there are a lot of them that are, seem very interesting and probably useful for a CyberSeq-esque uh, framework. Right. So would you say that um, CyberSeq as it is right now is um, sort of a very versatile product that can be used by researchers in um, a multiple or a multitude of different um, fields and structures right now? Would you say that CyberSeq has a versatility that can accommodate um, a lot of different researchers in different fields? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think that's why there's um, uh, as much interest as, as we're getting uh, from it. Yeah. Certainly. Right. And then sort of in uh, conclusion, um, talking about a little bit of the future of not only uh, you and your team, but also the future of CyberSeq, how do you plan on using or marketing uh, CyberSeq as a technique in the future for science or even the public like uh, CRISPR-Cas9 has done? Um, it's a good question. I, I don't know if we'd necessarily considered marketing. <laughs> Um, I think uh, really the um, releasing the paper and then having people use it really is is the I suppose marketing strategy that we have uh, as people use it and develop it and find exciting things with it um, that itself is the um, is is really like the main punch of of uh, people then getting excited about it and um, using it for their own research so. I don't know if there's necessarily anything we have to do on our end, um, aside from helping people use it well um, and find new biology with it. Right. So you would say it's now uh, going forward, it's up to the other researchers to decide whether or not CyberSeq would um, be useful to their specific research in where they're using it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, yeah, we don't, we don't have, um, much say in, in um, yeah, it's, it's up to the jury of, of the scientific field. <laughs> right. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Miller, for um, appearing on our podcast. It was an honor to have you. Congratulations to you and your team you. on your discovery on CyberSeq. And I hope you um, have a lot of success with the project going forward. Thank you so much.